Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hey, Janis. Hey, Philip. How are you doing? I know you had your bachelor party last weekend. So what's up for this podcast today? Yeah, that's true. I'm still like a little bit tipsy, I guess, but I'll power through this episode. And I think it'll be worth it because, yeah, today we're talking with Harris Odovazic about reporting structures for revenue operations, different compensation schemes, and also why the European Union is still lagging behind on the RevOps role versus the US. So, yeah, I think it's, it's worth powering through and it's a great show. So we hope you enjoy it. Harris, great to have you here. Thanks, you, Philip and Yalis. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, I think um, our paths first crossed in the Slack community of RevOps Co-op, which, by the way, we're also now a community partner of and uh, sponsoring. And um, I was really intrigued by the content you put out there and uh, like all the comments you did. I think it's a great community, very helpful, really. And um, one thing that um, I thought was particularly interesting is on LinkedIn, at one point, you did a sort of like a survey and you asked, where should revenue operations uh, should report into? And like to me, at least, the surprises were a bit interesting. And yeah, I just want to ask you to get started. If you could choose, who would you let revenue operations report into? Yeah, um, it's a very interesting question as everyone asks it. And um, to put a short spoiler, I would always say the CEO, but it depends. Like it depends on so many factors. It depends what is the starting point, right? If you start from scratch with RevOps, you have a lot more choice where to report. And um, and also like if you are a more mature organization and you're just thinking of implementing RevOps, then it will really depend what is your composition of your existing team, right? And most common, we see RevOps reporting to the chief revenue officer. And it makes a lot of sense. I think like around 66% in the surveys or the 120 people said CRO. And it's often seen as like the RevOps as the right hand of the chief revenue officer. And it can make a lot of sense if sales, marketing and customer success is reporting to the chief revenue officer. So really having this wide oversight of all the revenue teams, then it makes sense. I think one pitfall to avoid because it's a separate discussion, but often the chief revenue officer is actually the VP of sales where he neglects a little bit or even doesn't repass customer success with it. So then it creates a little bit, yeah, a bias. And I think we want to avoid a bias, like even taking one step back, what is revenue operation? It's like a strategic business partner to the revenue teams. And if it has like this bias, then you will always neglect one's action. And so that's a little bit the tricky part with the chief revenue officer. So not sure if you've seen that something like that similar before or made similar experiences. No, I I think it makes it makes perfect sense. Um like if you if you include that sort of like um, prerequisite that if reporting into the CRO, then CRO should also oversee basically the functions that revenue operations also tries to align, right? So marketing, uh, customer success, sales, and if not, then it's sort of like becoming more like a sales operations role. And that's of course not the goal. That's then that's then a bit problematic. I wanted to just quickly go back to so you said like in the beginning to cut it short, right? Um, ideally, reporting into the CEO. And one thing I'm wondering with that setup is like how do you then make sure that so if you have the revenue operations team reporting into the CEO, like how do you make sure that this is then not like competing or like creating issues with the CRO role, right? Um, because like they are both then reporting into the CEO. And that can lead to tension, I think. Yeah, I think I always like the analogy, analogy to the business partner, right? In HR, you have an HR business partner, which are often quite independent and very often also directly report to the CEO, even not to the head of, part, uh, head of people or HR. And it makes sense to have this really objective view. And the same principle 
can apply or apply to like revenue operation, right? It becomes, it's still a partner, the chief revenue officer, but the objectives of a chief revenue officer and the head of revenue operations are, I think, slightly different, right? So I think there's still a focus on sales and revenue, which is more with the chief revenue op uh, officer. And with the RevOps, I think it really gives like this additional layer of yeah, autonomy and less bias as well. So, but yeah, it's a good question. Like it, it can, it really depends also how like the job definition of the chief revenue officer is defined. I think that's the difference. So if, you, so if I understand you correct, if, if you had a real chief revenue officer basically owning the end-to-end -end customer experience pre, mid, and post-sale, like that would uh, would then would that be the preferred partner for for RevOps, or would you still say, well, you know, still report to the CEO because there's again more autonomy and maybe you're closer to you know topics that the CEO deems of strategic importance? Yeah. I think that point can be made, right? I think it is, like you basically just mentioned, and yeah, it's a very good discussion point. Mm -hmm. And I, I would probably always go to CEO, but I can definitely see how the RevOps chief revenue office also makes sense. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think we are obviously uh, talking to a lot of revenue operations leaders. And I think the question is always, how do you get out of your day-to-day -day into a more strategic role, Right. I think I'm also strongly believing that all the iterative improvements you're doing on a day-to-day -day ideally are part of the core strategy, right? They should align towards, you know, efficiency, being more effective, you know, uh, or having deeper insights. But obviously, yeah, I think uh, I think really having that end-to-end -end view and being very close also to the board and the board metrics can can be extremely beneficial. I'm, I'm curious how you see the CFO, right? I think... Uh, Uh, I mean, there's a there's a motion, uh, a notion of CFOs becoming more go-to-market CFOs. Um, obviously, especially in software, they're very close to you know also KPIs that apply to all things revenue, but maybe more uh, top down than bottom up. Um, what's your view on you know reporting to the CFO or maybe even in the SaaS company CEO? Yeah, I think you already gave a little bit the answer to it. Sorry. Because, <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. But it's great because you hinted to it. And the hint was like, if the CFO or chief operating officer, are, uh, how close are they to the commercial teams? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And if they are having a commercial background or a commercial experience in working close up sales team, I think it can make sense. I also used to report to a chief finance officer, also to chief operating officer. And, um, but they also understood very well the sales mode. And also the level of risk taking, I think, really is important, right? If you are like too rigid and too limiting, and that, that can become a problem because in sales, we do need to, what, in new business general, we do need to take risks as well, right? And this risk taking appetite is important, else, else many companies will not make it, right? So we cannot, We, I wish we could always calculate the perfect path, but sometimes you need to take a leap of faith. And I think if you are if you are chef of very strong Fauci finance officer background, the risk taking level is a little bit reduced, at least from my experience. So um can work if in the right setup. And especially if you don't have a chief revenue officer or you have like a really siloed department, sales and marketing and success or even a matrix organization, then it really can make sense. And with the caveat or the pitfall you would like to avoid that they have a commercial background. So I know Philip wants to ask a question, but I jump in here first. So, you know, when you say uh, risk-taking, I always think of Super Bowl ads, you know? Like, how do you calculate the ROI of a Super Bowl ad, you know, uh, before you actually run it? Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if many CFO would... Uh, would uh, would basically go for it, right? Um, so, so yeah. Uh, but Philip, please, over to you. Uh, no, it's fine, I think. Let's keep it flexible. I like it. Um, yeah, I've just just one question I have is like, like, is there like a role where you think, okay, this is something that revenue operations should never report into? Right? Because I think all of the C-level roles, 
and they can make sense. Like the CFO role can make sense if they have like a super strong commercial background, but if they're like only busy with like how they structure like the financials for like, I don't know, shareholder and like maximizing shareholder returns and focus on M&As and things like this. And obviously like probably revenue operations is not great. So I think there's always like a good reason, like for some of these roles, why it should not be the, the chosen one uh, to be wrote, reported into, but is there one that just should never be used? Yeah, I think never is, it is taking a slip down, like or not down, maybe even like a chief marketing officer or VP of marketing, VP of sales, VP of customer success, which is very uncommon. But um, one of this specific department, because then in the end, you have like a rebranded marketing ops, you have rebranded sales ops or customer success ops. And um, and that will like by definition create like a bias in the execution in both projects to prioritize, even if people say they don't, they want to be objective. But yeah, my boss is the chief marketing officer. And I have two projects and one is marketing related, which one am I going to pick? Like, it's like, by definition, you're setting like the wrong setting, like the wrong uh, trajectory for the team, even with the best intention, it's just like conflict is like guaranteed, right? And, and it still exists. I see many orgs where that actually exists more common, probably the, that this reports to sales, it originated probably with sales ops and then it got like a rebranding to market, to revenue operations. But I think the risk is there that um, people don't, yeah, that they don't see the success they wish to, right? And um, and we really, if you want to do rare ops, I always say it starts with the board level. So your board needs to sit together and align. We are doing revenue operations. We have that as a strategic function or to support and align our revenue teams. The leadership team is behind. And then you're setting the right condition for that. And that's why org structure is so important. You know, before this, I, I found a company called Fiber. And, uh, you know, I think org structure is something very abstract until you live in it and you realize how big of an impact it has on your day to day. I think you gave, just gave a great example of, you know, bias. And I mean, you know, usually. Uh, if you report to somebody and you don't only do projects for other teams, that doesn't last very long. So um, yeah, it can very much relate to that. Yeah, and also I mean, like I think I've also seen a lot of um, setups where really revenue operations is more like and like they're pairing up with like a VP of sales um, or like a director of sales, and then like revenue operations, very sales operations focused, is trying to really like improve the whole sales motion. And that, I mean, for sure, this can create value, but it is sort of like just a rebranding of the, the sales operations role. Uh, maybe sounds a bit cooler at that point, but um, it's just like, it just leaves out this whole, hey, what is revenue operations all about? And I think you, you said it in the beginning, right? It's it's about alignment, um, marketing, customer success, sales. So you're leaving out like two very important parts, um, particularly nowadays, like where you think like customer retention is so important. Um, and that plays a huge role. So customer success can have a huge impact um, on your metrics, can be very relevant for the board and, and your next funding round um, and things like this. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's wise not to leave it out. But with such a diverse role that revenue operations has, I think w one thing that is also very interesting is sort of like um, compensation structures. Yeah, so um, it is sort of like this supporting team it has an impact on direct revenue generation, right? At least that is the goal, increasing revenue. But then at the same time, like the impact is not so measurable. So so how do you create like a good compensation scheme? Like, should it be base? Should it be base plus bonus? Should there be a variable pay component? Uh, do you have a specific take on that? Yeah, I think the first caveat to point out, it's like really hard to measure. And I'm not the biggest fan of, to have one certain KPI for it, right? Like I never made a good experience with a KPI and that, and by definition, like you mentioned, as a support function, it is difficult. And I think what does help is thinking like what to have to, what do we have available? Well, we have a base available, we have a variable part and there is a bonus. Let's start with the bare bonus, right? The, you know, base, everybody has a base. And I think the bonus, I think it's the, easiest 
And I think a bonus makes sense for almost every company in every role based on performance, right? So based on company overall performance or specific team performance, did we reach a certain goal? And I'm a big favor that of really fair compensation and, and part of it is a bonus. And if this team reached a certain goals, if the revenue goals were aligned and then paying a bonus out, great start. I think that's on the base level. And the viral part is a little bit more tricky because it, because of the aspect how to measure it, right? And I usually like to see it on two matrices, right? So um, what is the impact you might have on revenue or on reducing go-to-market expense or like uh, profit and at the same level like responsibility. Some people might call responsibility seniority, but they are, I would say closely aligned, right? The more responsibility you have, you probably have a more senior role. And most of the time, right, when somebody really starts in a rare ops function of very junior role, there's probably no viable part, right? Because when it's a very junior role and probably has a limited impact. Like if you think of a system admin for a CRM, like the impact you could technically have on, on, on revenue is very limited. At the same time, the seniority, it's like, it's an ICP level, right? And you will contribute a level, but also like with a kind of limit, right? But on the other side, when you have like roles, like I think sales enablement, right? I think this impact, good training, I think it's so underestimated. And I've seen so many great sales enablement professional with actually a compensation part, with a variable part based on the team performance or what they, how much, how good the team is performing. And you can measure that, right? With people on the training impact. I think there you can have a viable part. And as well, the more the head of Ferrovson, the more bigger organization having like an overall performance on I would say high level of revenue numbers and growth numbers. And I think there you can add a viable part to it in addition to the bonus. That's how I would approach it. But thinking specifically of what the specific KPI is very hard. Yeah, would would you say that variable always means uh, it's a it's based on one KPI or could it be just quarterly uh, OKRs or goals uh, for you individually or as a team? I'm just curious uh, to understand this a bit better. Yeah, I think OKRs are good. OKRs are usually a very good indication. I'm usually a big fan that the whole or or company organization has the OKRs and variables. It's all part that are part of it, right? And and yeah, it could be linked to this OKRs. It can be, I think the link to the OKRs is very good. But also I think with the variable part, it really has also to be linked to the overall company performance. But even if the OKRs are reached, but there's a decline in revenue, like it's like, I don't think a variable part is very justified to be paid out. Same for bonus and then, right? There needs always to be this link to these growth figures or cost reduction or profits in the way. If you have profits, you probably have also revenue growth. So um, I think that link is very important. And then because, yeah, if you pay a bonus or viable part where, but the numbers, the all higher level numbers are not right, then you have a risk that you're compensating in a way, but it didn't actually lead to growth or something. So an example might be like uh, implementing new processes or implementing a new deal desk, right? But at the same time, there was no revenue growth. Yes, it uh, increased your accomplishment, right? Implementing this new function. But at the same time, there was no growth in revenue. It's like, it can send the wrong zig. Probably there was a whole wrong prioritization to start with. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so interesting. I mean, uh, at Fiverr, we did quarterly goals. Uh, and I think part of that uh, exercise is uh, to actually think about what you want to do. And then a specific percentage was based on company metrics, which was a very little one, actually, like, you know, 10, 15 percent, 20 percent. And then the rest was something that was actually a measurable and could be owned by the person or the team that is actually executing against it. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, what's your view on splits? So, um, you know, if, if you have a variable component, you know, base variable splits, what's typical in RefOps? What do you see? Uh, um, in splits in what? Uh, uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean, 70% uh, base, uh, 30% uh, okay. um, and variable. Oh, 
Yeah, I think that's where like the aspect of um, responsibility or seniority can come into place, right? How big the impact is, right? If you start, if you're very junior, you probably have a 100 base, right? And if you maybe increase with, let's say, have a RevOps manager or like a fleet, then you maybe have a 90-10 and maybe the head of RevOps might be have a 90-20 on one scale. And then in other variable, like on the same side, you can also then look at like the impact on revenue. And again, it will depend on how you measure it, what the splits might be. But yeah, splits make sense for sure. But but yeah, this is really a whole art. And I don't think, I think it's then also in part of closely linked to HR, right? Uh, the people team, like the compensation structure there. But it also makes sense uh, with the rest of the company. And yeah. So it's definitely for such an exercise, I would highly recommend also teaming up with the HR and people team um, to get to something that makes sense because often compensation is also often done also on the company-wide level, right? And then apply to the different teams. So it needs to be make sense and be fair for everyone as well. Yeah, I, I fully subscribe to that. Uh, I think uh, compensation is something that often a lot of startups don't think a lot about and then you grow larger and then you do an uh, exception here and an exception there and it bites you, right? So having clear salary bands, having clear understanding of, you know, the different org structure and, you know, also progression path, uh, you know, how do you promote, uh, how do you give responsibilities to also ICs, right? Like I'm a big fan of specialist career path. So I think engineering, principal engineers, that's a very typical thing. Often in go-to-market functions is less typical uh, i think the enterprise ae is a great example of this actually probably being the people who sometimes make the most money in the company even more than some of the executives i think it's a great thing actually and um, um something that um I, I because because just having a hierarchy and then everybody fighting for the manager positions is not really healthy and if somebody's amazing at what they do and they just do a great job i mean uh, give them more responsibility, give them better comp. And I think that is a really a like strategic company wide um, you know, thing the um HR team together with the uh with the executive team and then ideally also finance and ref ops should should work on uh, and consistency around these topics. But I know we wanted to also talk a bit about, you know, one more topic, uh, because you you are in Europe, you're in Amsterdam. Um, in Europe, RevOps has been uh, quite lagging, I'd say, uh, compared to the US. I think uh, in the US, it's been uh, something that you know has really driven a lot of competitiveness for the go-to-market teams over over the years, and it's slowly starting to have a you know big uh, uh, big focus in Europe. Uh, how would you you know compare those two? continents and you know why do you think it matters yeah. yeah i think definitely revops is a little bit behind in europe and but in many things europe is behind so i've been <laughs> looking at the tech space so no surprise there and yeah i think the origin why it's different i think it's just like yeah the scale of tech companies in the u.s is just more and you know, a level of innovation is was always more right and, um, but the good thing is for Europe is catching up is easier, right? So if there's always somebody you leader, they already did some mistakes, right? So we can learn from them, right? We can learn what not to do and then, um, applying more the right methods. I think there's a big opportunity. Like we talked about the org structure topic before. I think a lot of trial and error happened before in the US as well, right? where they, from when they, probably tried out different functions and uh, probably also the chief revenue officer was born at the same time. And now it's like easier to emulate, right? I think that's a good advantage that we are having here in Europe as well. And, um, and I think it's also like a general world skepticism, right? So if you know something that is working and then it's like, oh, what is this new thing? Like often as we see you talk with founders, like it's like RevOps, hmm. Of some see it as a trend. I had it a few years ago. I think now it's a little bit less. Or it was something, yeah, well, VC told us to do uh, web ops. That's also some comment I often hear. And the VCs, obviously, they, um, they know the US stuff more, they know the success more. And so there's this 
negative, not negative connotation, but like a little bit resistant to it. I think it's getting definitely less. And I think always like every three months, I always check like how many job openings are there on LinkedIn for revenue operation. And that is increasing, right? It's definitely an upward trend and people are talking more about it. So that's good. But at the same time, like I was recently in a conference and then I asked like, hey, how many people know what RevOps is? Not that many hands went up. So it's still a new function, right? And it's definitely more popular in the US. And, um, but yeah, it's going to take a few more years till it's mainstream. Yeah. What I find super fascinating is that even in the US, I think in general, right? I'd say, yes, there has been a lot of shift and a lot is a lot clearer, but at the same time, it still feels that for most of the revenue teams, there's a clear playbook and those are changing. I'm not sure if that's, if we've achieved that already for revenue operations in general, right? Like what's best practices, uh, you know, like. What's the best com structure? What's the best org structure for RevOps teams? Where should they report into? Uh, I think that is that is something that is probably even on a global level uh, is great things to explore. And I mean, you're doing a fantastic job with all the content you're putting out. And you know, I think also research, uh, really quantitative research you're doing. Yeah? I think that's the biggest, right? When we uh, like some people are skeptical, they always say like uh, you always should take advice from people who done it. But at the same time, universities have a place and RevOps is not studied that much really. Like there are not many RevOps paper. And like a business studies and economic studies, they make sense. Like else there wouldn't be that many. You can learn, you can observe, you can analyze stuff. And a lot of stuff it's happening for marketing and for sales. Customer success less. It's more probably the support than for RevOps close to nothing, right? So there's nothing really a formally or formally accepted definition. And uh, I think that's going to take some time. And I think people are going to do more research in that space. But more on the business side, yeah, it's also in the US. When I talk to US colleagues, it's like they also have still to educate people what is where ops, right? It's like the bubble is the bubble is bigger in the US, right? It's two bubbles, but the US bubble is bigger. <laughs> and uh, but they also live in a bubble and then you still need to do a lot of education work. And it's okay. It's like normal. So, um, and there are also different camps as well, right? So some who see RevOps differently and I'm more the strategic camp. There's more the operator camps, different camps. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who knows? Maybe everybody's right. And um, so that needs to be established over time. But I think the whole difficulty is because it's like, so much, right? It's a support function for sales, for sales, for marketing, customer success. In some companies, it touches for the product, especially if it's PLG. Then it can touch finance, it can touch legal, if you're thinking of deal desk and procurement, especially when talking of enterprise sales companies and then uh, enterprise sales, then um, the legal and the procurement aspect is just becoming more important, right? And um, so, yeah, there are these differences and it's a little bit the wild, wild west. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's great. I think that's great. And I hope we're doing our part here with the Red House Lab to preach the gospel and, um, yeah, share share good, uh, well thought through definitions. <laughs> also with your support, of course, uh, Harris. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, uh, we always ask everybody who comes to a show, like one closing question, always the same question. And it's, uh, what advice would you give yourself when starting your career all over again, looking back at all the experience you've gained so far? Oh, very good question. It's so funny. Like, I think I even wrote like a little blog about that. I interviewed different people and put it in there and getting the views. I think for me, the number one skill I would recommend to everyone investing in something with RevOps is communication. Like get really good communication skills. Also, will they hire somebody for RevOps? I would really test them on his communication skills and stakeholder management skills because you have to work with so many people and so many different business units and everybody's different. And often it, the solution is very often very obvious, but to get everybody on board, I think that's the biggest, biggest challenge and creates the biggest delays. 
So that if you can communicate well and align your stakeholders, because RevOps is all about alignment, and if you can do that well, then you can succeed and have a very good career in RevOps. Love it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Harris, for joining. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank so, you. I appreciate it. Here. And yeah, hopefully yeah. talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you. Thank you.